Hello, BroadwayCon, and welcome to Thrilling Combination Movement Work on Broadway and in the theater. I'm Ruthie Fierberg. I am so thrilled to be your moderator today. I am an arts journalist here in New York and the creator and host of the podcast, Why We Theater, on the Broadway Podcast Network. It is a podcast that integrates theater and the stories that we see on stage to inspire us to make change in our offstage lives around social issues. Today, though, we are talking about my other favorite topic, movement and storytelling. For those of you who know me, you know I am obsessed with dance and choreography. Um, we have a phenomenal panel lined up for you as we talk about all different types of movement on stage this year. Um, as you may know, my past Broadway con panels, we've talked really strictly about choreography, but we've got some variety for you here today. So we have Luis Salgado, who is a dancer, choreographer, director, educator, and cultural community organizer as the founder and co-artistic director of Revolución Latina. You may know him as a performer from the original Broadway cast of In the Heights, on which he was also the assistant choreographer, as well as performing in Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, Rocky, and On Your Feet on Broadway. He is also directed and choreographed all over the world, including productions of In the Heights, On Your Feet in Holland, and Cirque du Soleil's Paramore in Germany. Welcome, Luis. Hola, thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure. <laughs> We're so excited. Um, Gypsy Snyder is here with us. Gypsy is a circus performer, director, choreographer, and co-founder and co-artistic director of The Seven Fingers. She began performing with her family at the age of four, count it four, in the Pickle Family Circus, a more contemporary style of circus that we will get into today that has an emphasis on storytelling and emotion. She earned a Drama Desk nomination for her choreography of Traces Off-Broadway and won the Drama Desk for her circus creation and choreography of the 2013 Broadway revival of Pippin alongside Chet Walker. She is also the aerial consultant on Moulin Rouge the musical. Welcome, Gypsy. It's such a pleasure to be here with such fantastic people. Well, thank you. <laughs> Amazing. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we have Denise Devia Johnson, who is a stunt performer and inter intimacy coordinator for film and television, as well as an intimacy director for live performance, including theater. They have a master's in sociology and a master's in performance, which I find incredibly fascinating to have both of those things together. Um, Denise founded Red Sun Productions, a hip hop theater production company, and is part of Poetic Theater Productions and Black Latina Movement. They have worked on HBO Succession, Pose, and Steven Spielberg's upcoming film, West Side Story. Welcome, Denise. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to meet you all. Looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to have you all. You guys can all stay unmuted if you wish, because I want this to be a dialogue between all of us. Um, and I want to start by asking, do you remember the first time or an early time in which you expressed yourself through movement? What did that look like and feel like? What were you trying to express? Go for it, Luis. I mean, it's it's so basic. I was in my mom's bedroom and Chayang, who still to this day, I'm in love with him, um, had done Fiesta in America. That was a big hit in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And all the TV stations had um, basically agreed to showcase the music video at the same hour. So this was a, a, a Puerto Rico event that Chayanne did Fiesta in America. And I remember Leonor Constanzo choreographed that music video who eventually became one of my teachers. And um, an Argentinian Boricua because she, two major Argentinians who in the island became more Boricua than I am. Um, she was one and for of, those who don't know, Boricua is, you know, Puerto Rican. I was gonna say like contemporary colloquial speak for Puerto Rican. Well, yeah. it's not colloquial actually, it's the original. But Boricua, it, it comes from the Taino, um, you know, culture, the, the mm -hmm. Native Indians of the island. And so when, when for Columbus, he came in and it was Puerto Rico because it was a rich port. For right. The city. But for the Tainos, it was Boriquen. It was the, right. the island of Boriquen. For the natives, yeah. yeah. And so, and then, so therefore, all of us who consider ourselves with Taino blood were Boricuas. 
Um, and so anyway, the I was in the in my mom's bedroom. Cheyenne did his thing, and I happened to be alone in the apartment in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, so I danced like crazy. I was about I don't know eleven years old, and then something weird happened. I had learned a lot of the puzzles of this choreography in one take, but I already had the 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 itch that I wanted to play with that vocabulary I just watched and make it my own. Also, there was a little bit of, of like, what do I remember from what I just watched, right? Like there's one mm. thing that I think I learned and that's the other one of like, how do I emulate or try to recreate what I just saw, one take only. So I spent probably the next two hours dancing in the living room of my house and I ended up creating choreography. And that was the thing that I was like, how how time just flew is exactly how I want to pass the rest of my life. Wow. And so that, that what I think is the memory that immediately comes to my mind. That's incredible. That's incredible. You were almost like testing yourself. And essentially that's like, that's what iterative choreography is, you know, taking from a movement vocabulary and making it your own to, you know, but to also, emotion. But also to your point, like it was a way of me discovering so many things about myself and the environment around me, including culture, right? The fact that all this, all these TV, as I say it to you, I realize all these TV stations were honoring a dance mm-hmm. video, a, a, a singing dance video. It was relevant. It mattered. And I was able to own it for myself and then re-explore myself in it. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, summarizes my life in many, many ways. Wow. Denise Gypsy, who wants to go next? Who's feeling it? Go, Denise. <laughs> oh, not it. Yeah. Not it. <laughs> I thought that was, oh, me. <laughs> no. That's a two, and then I was like, no, that's not it. Okay, I got this. I got this. I got this. <laughs> um, I think it's the the moment that I remember, it's, it's the pivotal moment, um, had a lot to do with my family. So from childbirth, first my my parents were performers with the San Francisco Mime Troupe, which is a really politically active um, theater that happens for free in the park since the late 50s, early 60s. Um, revolutionary political theater, uh, especially during the Vietnam War, hugely informative and wonderful work. And I was really raised as a baby in that company. And then my parents founded the Pickle Family Circus as an off sort of in using their facilities as a kind of offspring of that. And the Pickle Family Circus was also very sort of community oriented and really there as a nonprofit to support other nonprofits um, and, and do that through creating community through art. And the thing about being raised in the circus and traveling and and being raised by all of these incredible humans was that it for me art was everywhere and especially in san francisco in the 1970s it was all artists who were also activists and so i felt like oh this is how everyone is this is how the world works like that's your universe and at some point we were on tour in Anchorage, Alaska, I think. Mm. And we had been training this thing, me and my dad, this new number. And I was like, hating it. I was like, I don't want to do this. And I, I, something about working with your parents is this, it's almost like, like art is like a chore. Yeah. But it had this moment where I made this entrance all by myself. And so the first time I went through the backdrop that was painted by my mother, went through the backdrop and the lights hit me. And I was like, it was me. It was an, I was an independent body Mm. on stage with like this pivotal, like whatever I do is going to be now registered by the people watching me. I'm not, I'm not an appendage of my parents or an appendage of this organization. And I, we finished the number, I came off stage and I just started sobbing and I had been on stage since I was little, 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 Yeah. but all of a sudden it, the power of it and the lights of physically embodying the act as a as myself as a human, um, it was like it was like taking crack. I not that I've ever taken crack, but but what you imagine was, um, exactly that it was and just, it was, it was so addictive. 
it was addictive and it was also um, so much about empowering. I, I can't quite explain it, but it was that, that flooding in of my, my body and my soul can actually express itself um, and, and communicate with an audience. And somehow realizing that I was seven, I think, um, having that realization so at such an early age um, and being able to separate it from, from my family and from my community, but as an individual, um, yeah, there was no turning back. I find that so interesting because something I was going to get to later, but that stood out to me from an interview of yours that I read was how much you, how much you live in the individuality of the circus performer, both as a performer yourself and as a choreographer and director mm -hmm. that, you know, it's something that you perceived as different from a lot of dance um, because dance, you know, you have to, it has to be set on you and it's often, you know, ensembles of people doing the same things, but that, um, so I think that that's really telling that the moment that came to mind for you is a moment of you individuating from your family. Mm -hmm. Um, and it carries through in your work. Denise, what's coming up for you? This is a really interesting conversation. I never really thought about it, but I guess if I had to talk about like my first attraction to movement, mm -hmm. um, I played basketball. It was a family thing. My father played in the NBA and so did my uncle. It was a way to feel connected to them. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I wore knee pads, um, <laughs> which is kind of significant. I wear knee pads in all of my jobs. Um, I heard that, I heard that's part of your kit. It is, um, which is interesting because when I'm, well, I guess back to the movement stuff, it's interesting yeah. because you learn a play and you're supposed to run it. Same thing when you're doing stunts, um, you talk about what's supposed to happen, but, you're, but you really need to stay heads up, mm -hmm. watching out for your team and any other players on the set and for crew and camera, making sure you're really heads up and... I never thought, um, I went on to play basketball in college. Um, and division one for those who don't know, which is a very big deal. Um, I, I think the, the most interesting thing is I didn't know that you could study so much about one aspect of movement. I remember mm -hmm. working over picks, under them, switching, and just how detailed every step was and how you could gain time by minimizing your movements. Mm -hmm. And there were ways to explore something that, I don't know, you kind of take for granted, but you could get into great depth of it. Mm -hmm. And the teamwork and what it pulls from you, what it feels like to not feel good, to miss shots, to be tired, to be exhausted, to want to go home, to miss your mom. <laughs> yeah. But, but to have to dig deep and invest in, in yourself and in a vision that's, that's greater than all of you. I'm also just so excited that you brought up basketball because I think um, so often like art and sport are pitted against each other. And I think that they're just iterations of physical demands, um, athleticism, precision, all of the things that you were just talking about, like every person in this room that I'm looking at is both an artist and an athlete. Like there is physical demand to what you do. Um, and I think that they're just more closely related than we often consider, than we often um, put them in dialogue against each other rather than with each other. So super cool, super cool. Okay, so each of you specializes in a different like sector of movement professionally. So I want to go a little bit one by one again. Um, Luis, what led you, like you talked about this very beginning experience of dancing, what kept you in the dance world? What, do, what feels right to you about dance specifically? You know, I, I should answer your question, but I actually want to go back for a second to go back for a second. I want to go back to sports because you're right. Gypsy is bringing the Cirque background, right? And then the basketball. And for me, it's boxing. And, and as you asked me this question, um, it reminded me that Rocky was like the perfect it was a perfect performance for me to go in my third Broadway show at that moment because 
I mix my two passions. But if you ask me what has kept me wanting to dance, probably is boxing. It's that it's that I started moving and interpreting through the incredible lens of uh, Stephen Hoggett, you know, what other options we can do with movement and how we play and how we create and how you nurture an ensemble beyond the ballet bar, beyond the dance step. Um, and and I think that that was very, very telling. I had already worked with City Company um, and I had already fallen in love with viewpoints and creating theater and movement through the utilizing of both Suzuki and viewpoints. But I think working with Stephen Hoggett and going back to the boxing gym and my roots of having done that, because I fought a Matera in Puerto Rico um, before before really becoming a professional performer, um, the that that re-motivated me to make new discoveries in movement and the way that more contemporary natural um, behavior can be utilized to enhance the story rather than just showcase my choreographic skills yes um and i think that 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 would be my answer i am now motivated by everything that's not dance even though i want to dance even though I want to move and kick and lay out and, and cambray, um, you know, I'm so much more intrigued by by exploring what Suzuki does next to a jazz thing, what Viewpoint does next to a boxing thing, right? And hmm. what all of that gives telling of a story. Yeah. I, I guess that would be my answer. I think that's beautiful. And I, and I have to riff off that. Please. Same thing. I like to use um, my Brazilian jiu-jitsu practice when I'm coordinating intimacy scenes. How are we going to move bodies from one place to another safely and controlling them? I think it's really important that we talk about movement and the continuum versus it being binary of art and sport, putting them against each other, because I find so many similarities. And even connecting with performers, seeing what their choice of movement is and then starting to speak to them along those lines versus using basketball analogies, which might not work for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me more a little bit, Tanise, about what you mean by having the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu inform the intimacy choreography. Like if, even as so far as to give a specific example, if that's helpful. Well, it's interesting. Um, in Jiu Jitsu, it's all about controlling bodies. Mm -hmm. and sweeping from top to bottom, getting control. So if we think about um, any sort of intimate lovemaking choreography, sometimes they want to see a sweep from top to bottom and we see a different move in power play or passion who's mm. receiving an action, who's giving an action and who's on the receiving end. So particularly using those type of sweeps, that help control the body from top to bottom and then mounting on top again, but using that type of technical language and sport language even mm -hmm. in a work environment so we can empower individuals with strong boundaries and then they can get lost in the characterization. And I guess I'll ask the same, a similar question to you, like why intimacy direction? You know, if you like, you have these vocabularies from other places, why not become a basketball coach? Why not become a martial arts instructor? What is it about intimacy and the movement in that discipline that um, you're attracted to? Um, I'm really into healing, uh, collective healing and the consent movement and really changed my life mm -hmm. and the way I approach my relationships and my work. So I'm, when I found out about it, I kind of remembered all the things I had gone through, mm. the things you forget in order to keep going. Um, I was sad for a little bit, but had to forgive myself. And um, all the times I didn't say things or I didn't speak up or I went with it because I wanted to be a good actor. Um, and you know, that's hard because there's, there's something about creating art and wanting it to be well received, but also this aspect of people pleasing mm. and wanting an opportunity and, and not, not realizing that you can say no and still be successful and still be well received. So I found a lot of hope 
in this industry and the opportunity that we could learn different ways to approach the material. Mm -hmm. The most exciting thing for me is um, everything I've done in my life has prepared me for this moment. I've had great opportunities working in recovery field of drug and alcohol addiction, um, the sociology, race and class, um, and being a black person in, in America. So this idea of meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. being willing to see and hear them, introduce new tools without shame or guilt, and give them the option to move forward in a different manner so that they don't have homework when they go home. Mm. There's no secrets that they have to hide. That they get to process in the space and in the work rather than having to do that extra on their own. Yeah, and, and I, I'm, I wanna be honest, introducing it into the workplace is just the start. Yes. Because if you say a word like boundaries and consent, so what? If you're not practicing it, if you're not thinking about it, if you're not letting your breath drop in and see where it feels in your body and talking about this on other times, it's going to be hard to be in a workplace and, and try a new skill set with confidence. So yeah. I just encourage people to keep getting reps, keep talking about it, keep leaning into difficult conversations, keep asking questions. Yeah. I mean, what I have found fascinating and vital about intimacy work um, from what I've learned and tell me if this is true to your experience, but that it is inclusive of choreography, you know, when it comes to a makeout scene, a sex scene, things that like, like, I think some people are thinking of that already when they're like, oh, an intimacy director or choreographer, they make the movement of this, but that it can also be the movement of any kind of intimacy. It can be an angry incident. It can be a secret telling in, in you know, scene. It can be all of anything that brings closeness um, through story and through physicality. It's, does that feel true to you? I love how you're broadening the definition of intimacy. Too often we limit it to just sensual scenes or nudity or what have you simulated acts when intimacy truly means familiarity or closeness. Mm -hmm. So we have some level of intimacy with everyone in our lives, whether it's our mail carrier, you know, our, our soup at, the, at our apartment, you know, we see these people and we come and go and there is some level of intimacy. So the idea is to use an intimacy coordinator. Anytime there's awkwardness, tenseness on set, if you want to build chemistry between people, if you want to build trust, if you want to build um, a lexicon of language so that you are working towards an, building an empathetic ensemble, intimacy coordinators are, are the way to go. Yeah. Gypsy, I'm seeing you nod along. <laughs> and before I ask you a little bit more about you and Circus, I wanted to give you the opportunity if there are anything that's coming up for you in terms of you know, working with bodies in a demanding and, and intimate way. Yeah, um, the, the circus community, especially what I know from my childhood involved so much trust and familiarity and not just because my family was within that, but then there's really this idea that a circus troupe is, has that infrastructure, that fam family interest infrastructure. And then we have that added reality that you're actually putting your life in someone else's hands at all times. Mm -hmm. And the, the level of risk is, and risk assessment is so high, it's so heightened that actually we've had issues with intimacy because personal boundaries get neglected because we're so heightened in like throwing yourself and trusting that then all of a sudden your trust can be compromised. Mm. And that's been really in the last couple of years, this new conversation, because like intimacy issues within a family where it's harder to say, this is a, someone I'm related to and I'm not feeling it, or they're taking advantage of a situation in one way or another has mm -hmm. come up in circus where you're like, I've trusted this person with my life. We're complete. I mean, the body contact is very similar to dance um, or intimacy scenes, I'm sure in theater. 
plus the added risk. So there's just so much contact and that it makes it even harder to say, I don't feel comfortable, which is what you, you might think the opposite, right? You might think I'm right. putting, you could, I could die doing this move with you, but actually it's even harder to say, you're making me feel uncomfortable in other ways. Yeah. Or even, I mean, I think most circus people know have this wonderful confidence to say, oh, that's, that's safe. That doesn't feel safe. Let's stop. That, that's just a, a rule. There's no point in getting injured. If you don't feel good with the rigor, who's pulling you in the air. If you're about to do a move and you don't feel you have full focus or you need to, to do, you know, do it in lines one more time, all of that, we seem to have access to. We know there's no point right, in around injured. physical safety. I think around physical safety, we know yeah. You learn it from a kid. There's no point in getting injured. There, you, you have to be, or at least what I encourage in my work is what I call the intelligent acrobat. Mm -hmm. I don't know your body. I need you to tell me I'm, I'm here to push, but you're here to say, oh, oh, wait, 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 that's too far. Yep. And at all times, I mean, and in, in, in every way. And so now what's happened in the last couple of years is we've had to say, it's not just a, a physical safety issue. It's also an emotional and personal um, and even sexual issue. If you are right. feeling uncomfortable, there need to be these channels to get toward the intimacy that we're trying to achieve on stage. And what um, I think makes your circus different is that there is so much more to talk about than just physical safety and, and physical intimacy. So what is it about the type of circus that you do, Gypsy, that has kept you in the circus world that makes it the medium you choose to tell stories through? From, from a very young age, I was actually not a very good acrobat. And uh, in the sense, I don't really believe in good or bad, but I was not technically very strong mm -hmm. and um, didn't really have the body that it take, that it would take to achieve, um, or not the discipline, I think, to achieve what is now considered a, a, a basic standard level of excellence in circus. And um, my heart and mind were from a very young age, much more interested in the storytelling. I was studying theater from a really young age. My parents were obviously also very, um, I was just around theater a lot, not only mm -hmm. circus. And so for me, the movement of like pointing your toes, doing a trick, like fit, doing the trick with all the concentration, stop, ta-da, get an applause, <laughs> never interested me. Like, at all. And now we're sort of, you know, post the Cirque du Soleil world, we're sort of used to a more contemporary style, but mm -hmm. even Cirque du Soleil really goes for the spectacular. Mm -hmm. Our shows are supposed to be the opposite of spectacular. They're mm -hmm. supposed to be, how can the humans on stage connect and put up a mirror to the audience with all of our flaws and all of our imperfections all of our pathos, all of our needs. And so that the audience isn't seeing the perfect body doing the perfect thing. They're connecting to the flawed person. And so that then when the flawed person does something spectacular, we feel a, a triumph within ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and so Seven Fingers or any of the work that I've done in my entire career has always been, how can I, uh, uplift the individual on stage um but from a real true point of humanity and not just celebrate their incredible body that can do incredible tricks because yeah. i think most people in the audience can't even relate relate to that you can be awestruck by it it and when we were talking about sports what i find so amazing about sports and so theatrical about sports is like you will look at the olympics or the nba and you're like it's in, you can't believe what they're doing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's superhuman. And for so many people that you, where do we connect to that? We connect to it because there's a human drive that, that we all have. And whether, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to connect to that human drive in all the work I do, which, oh. you know, it's funny because then we did Pippin and what was, you know, it was like the circus circus. It's like the opposite of what I do really now. And yet it worked so well because it's this character so desperately trying to, 
to find meaning in his life and and will he ever achieve something extraordinary so so the pathos or the i mean pathos what i mean is i find us humans so completely pathetic we're all <laughs> so mortal and and we're all headed in one direction can we get on the same page and 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 explore joy and possibility together in a in a vulnerable and very true way yeah and it's so funny you transitioned right into what i was going to ask you is that i want to get into some of the examples of like some of the work that we have seen of yours or may see of yours and like where the storytelling is in that so if you could gypsy do me a favor and pick a moment from pippin say that you were able to tell that flawedness through movement um and and it can be something tiny it can be something big or it doesn't even have to be the flaw another aspect of character but tell me the the plot or the emotion and the movement that you matched with it um well it's difficult because the circus really was there to seduce pippin's character in an extraordinary way mm -hmm. but but what we managed to achieve through um the choreography was um connecting to the fragility of the situation so my one of my favorite moments in the show and i had to fight for it was at the end of simple joys we did this trick and this is this is not something that's like choreographically brilliant it's literally like was a trick that sometimes we were going to miss so patina miller is holding this hula hoop up in the air and this guy does this this round off backflip through the hula hoop and if he misses like if he clocks the hoop with his feet it gets ripped out of patina's hands and this is like on the button of the number mm -hmm. and i remember telling diane so if he misses it he's gonna set give the, the hoop back to we'll get the hoop back to patina and we'll go around and sh like diane was like what do you mean we're, we're going to broadway we're not missing any trick right. there was this right. that you normally you would have to adjust it so that it's nailable every time like, what is the thing they can do every time perfectly if it needs to be adjusted you know make that happen exactly so there there was sort of this i mean i can't even describe to you the silence in the room the 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 orchestra leader going like we that's not a thing right and, and director diane paulis who you're talking about being like what what and so i just said guys, just trust me. It's going to happen one day. We're not going to plan for it. There's going to be this big end of the number and it's going to flop and we'll be just fine. So late in the run at the, uh, at ART, it finally happened. Mm -hmm. He punched a little too high, clocked it with his feet. And the, I mean, the silence, it was the most beautiful moment of my life. It was really like the entire theater, the band, every single actor on stage, and Patina just looked at him and he, oh, hell no, we're doing that again. She just took it and ran. We got her the hoop, they did the trick and they got a standing ovation, like in the middle of the freaking show. It's amazing. And, but the, the idea that there's, that you can integrate this idea that it's not gonna be perfect is something that I, I'm, I felt in, in general, in the in the method of the broadway technique was missing the flawed mm -hmm. moment and um consequently every single time an acrobat was in that we rehired acrobats we changed the moves we made things that worked for their bodies we um we embraced this idea that the essential moment in theater that is imperfect and that coupled with the fact that Matthew James Thomas has three microphones because if one goes wrong, we have to have another one. If that one goes wrong, it's like this perfection, this like almost televised yep. thing of like, these people are perfect. I think what we love in theater is actually embracing the live potential for, for our, our, our little failings. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. that doesn't really speak to my like choreography and my techniques for developing choreography. No, but, but it, it is, is storytelling and movement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Luis, tell me an example from your experiences, whether that's, I mean, choose what you want in the Heights, Rocky, you on your No, I don't want to talk about your question anymore. I want to go back to what Gypsy just said. <laughs> so I'm sorry for being the, 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 the rebel here that, 
But like, there's just so much in everything you just said. Number one, the flaw, how beautiful. Like geometrically speaking, I surround myself with brilliant choreographers who want this perfect idea. Um, and when I, for example, directed in the Heights and choreographed it for, especially for the gala production, I wanted this rawness, this that uh, it's being asymmetrical accomplishes, right? Like if I have three and three and two and two, whatever, like it's perfect picture and it's clean and it's beautiful. It's a little bit what Gyps is saying, bro, it should be, right? Like we have this idea, it should be perfect. But if I but if I tilt it a little bit and let it be a little bit messier on this side and seven people and there's five here, it just does something in the audience journey. It feels so much more human. Um, and you know, you talk about Pippin and I think about that trapeze moment with the grandma and how wonderful that was, or, you know, just the concept of the, of Diane Paulo's, like with the beginning theater and then ending raw, mm -hmm. what more vulnerable than that? Mm -hmm. Like we are doing all this razzle dazzle, this ta-da thing that you're referring to, but we end up in the essence and the heart of what Pippin really is. He's looking for, I am enough. Everything that I am here standing, it's enough. That's intimacy, right? We're giving the audience an intimacy to the story with the idea that I don't need all this razzle dazzle for you to be with me. And all the movement that in the bur in the early beginning of Pippin is done allows us to believe that at the end, that we're just standing there and that the movement is the non movement conformity and so I, I I thrive in that kind of idea and concept. So when you ask me then about myself like i think i have to go to rack time you know rack time was an incredible um opportunity for me as a storyteller and and where did you do that production i did that production in new jersey at the axel rudd theater mm -hmm. um and you know i get to take a lot of liberties in how i can do something in the axel rudd theater in new jersey because it's not like right we're in tryouts tomorrow on broadway or anything right, like that. right and and uh, th this um Sarah, you know, it's doing her, her big number. And all of a sudden, I, I had done three towers conceptually. So what is movement again, right? Where do we put our movement? Um, I had done these three towers that from those three towers, I ended up doing 36 compositions through the show. Um, and to the point that one of the towers gets split in half and we open it for like the ball game. Um, and you know, in Sarah's solo, all you want is her voice and there's nothing screwed up stage her. But when we're talking about race and culture and minorities, like the first thing that happened to me is like, oh, you might be the first immigrant to ever direct rack time. It's like, I wanted to say so many things. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, like, so that gave me the lens of like, what's my job doing this piece? This is an American musical that touches on you know, the division of so many cultures and whatnot. Um, and basically I stole that moment from Sarah. I had the full ensemble move the towers. So the crumbling and the pain that she has as she's telling her baby, I'm sorry, you look like your father. This is what I, this is why I did it. Like these towers are moving and literally you could hear the on the floor and then we started, I know we, we have very little time, so I'm gonna rush through this, but we started with all this light and then the light has been stolen and stolen and stolen. We end up with this little tiny center center focus spot that only like points at her nose. And and, and basically the audience comes at the end, it's like, why, why are you stealing this moment from Sarah? It's like, precisely because now you wanna listen to her story. Because mm -hmm. through so many years, we didn't care about you know, the black community stories. And Sarah, even in this particular story, she doesn't even get to tell her story that much. Cole House is telling her story. This white family is telling her story. Sarah doesn't really get to tell or fight for her story that much. So what's happening on stage with the towers and with the light, it's what has happening socially. And that movement from both the lighting and the towers is doing the job that, that all of us should be doing, is saying to us, listen. And so for me, that would be a moment, which is not choreographically, again, kicking my leg, but that all that movement accomplished something and a catharsis in the audience desire to listen to Sarah's story. That would be mine. Amazing. Whoa, to think about that in such a different way. All right. I mean, obviously I have a bazillion more questions, but Denise, I want to hear an example from you and your work of, you know, the physicality and story, um, if you can 
pick some sort of moment or whatever it means to you really? I'm going to talk about it a little generally here. Um, Do it. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with people to educate, um, liberate and question how the world works. I think when we work with intimacy, it's really hard to not see ourselves in the work, but to tell the intimacy of the character. And it's a really fun process to watch people go from being self-conscious to relaxing and seeing a bigger picture and then eventually seeing the opportunity. For instance, um, if you think about a slave play mm -hmm. and you know the responsibility and privilege we had to introduce different types of simulated sex acts on stage and who knew who could be inspired by that who could be like oh i was thinking about that but i was too nervous to bring it up to my partner and the conversations that can come from that and the opportunity we have so it's really exciting that process of it becoming larger than ourselves and using the stage or, or the screen as an opportunity to keep talking about the humanness <laughs> um, and how, how things are flawed. And I guess the other thing I'd say is I really like scenes that have mistakes. Mm -hmm. I like love making scenes with head butting, falling off beds, giggling, awkward moments. Oh, my arm is stuck or like what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we we are bringing in the flaws and the humanness, like um, like Gypsy was saying, and and the importance of that, seeing ourselves in the work, not seeing extraordinary people, but but seeing ourselves in the work. Yeah, I do want to ask you specifically about West Side Story because obviously the original movie intimacy direction was not even a you know not a flicker in anyone's eye. Um, so how was working on that film that is just i mean it is laced with you know the the t like you talk about tension and closeness it is the the entire plot is tension it's two gangs against each other it's multiple love stories it's um you know choreographic intimacy violent intimacy all of you know sexually violent like how were you not overwhelmed? And, you know, because we're running low on time, like if you can just describe a little bit of the conversations you were having that you were excited to be able to bring to a new West Side Story. Well, it's really exciting. There was a really big team that contributed to all of that. It was a small mm -hmm. part of it. And what's interesting about this work is working with dancers and veteran actors and some new actors, you have the opportunity to introduce new tools Again, I just want to say it goes back to approaching the work with curiosity and wonder, mm -hmm. avoiding shame and guilt, and offering things that people can try in the opportunity to add time and space so that we can foster more collective healing, which might sound kind of lofty, but that's all we can do in this work. We're, we're moving towards a target goal. We want to have this production. We, we've got to get it filmed. And where's our ease and grace for accepting new information and trying new things in the journey? So that's the contribution I try to, to bring to the table. Yeah, I guess what I'll end with, since we kind of started with like your earliest personal moments, I I'm interested to learn about now as your identities have evolved and we'll give, I know it's like such a huge question, but you know, the, the, abridged version of your answer. Um, how does your identity, whatever that means to you, how does who you are, um, culturally, gender identification, whatever it is, how does that inform the work that you do, either when it's tied to that, like when you're telling a story that feels like your story and when you're telling a story that is different from your story? Luis, you want to go? Well, the, 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 honestly, the first thing that I think about is about this director, Puerto Rican man. Thank you, Luis. His name is Luis Caballero. 
And, you know, I, I have this, this way of working sometimes and I, I, I will forever be a student. So thinking about Stephen Hoggett, Andy Black and Bueller, Jerry Mitchell, Sergio Trujillo, Diane Paulos, Charlotte, um, Bartlett Share, like all these people that I have had the honor of working next to, they come to the room in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, what, what is Barless version of this versus what is Jerry's version? Like, and it, it, it influences a little bit how I think about, you know, the journey that I'm gonna take on a particular choice that I'm making. But often, um, Luis Caballero is present in me. He's, his Puerto rican -ness, the way that he expressed, the way that he works on the room and he makes his, his dramatic, hey, venga mi gente, you know? And, and so I guess why I'm saying about Luis is because I learned through Luis's work to be myself. You know, you walk into a room and you want to have your glasses and, you know, you want to act like a director and it's like, no, I want to walk into a room and have my cafe con leche and I want to be like, que paso mi gente, you know? And, and if I can bring that to the room, I think that that's a step into an intimate world, you know, that, that people are seeing an honest process and they can open up to the work. They can open up to you. They can open up to the challenges that together we're facing. And, and I think that that, um, is the thing I want to share here. Like as a choreographer, we, we challenge people to, difficult movement and especially when they're not dancers and you're not always working with dancers right mm -hmm. uh, as a director you're challenging people to emotional deep things that they experience through the character or in their lives and and so what i bring to the room or in my latinaje or my Boricua or my being just simply me um it's it's that the freedom i got through the arts i want to bring to the process mm. and that's that gypsy what about you um, I think right now, you know, I'm a little bit older than everybody else in the room. Um, and I, you know, to, to be 50, you know, everybody during this time, this pandemic, this, um, time of political change and social change, uh, so I'm, I'm experiencing that in my fifties and what's really in the void of live theater, I am really um, re-evaluating and re-appreciating the power of culture in society. Mm. And li the live congregation of humans coming together to ideally participate in art happening live um, is, now the essence of everything I want to do. Why is this important? Why, why is this essential? And it's maybe because I'm in my 50s that the idea that it's not essential has really come to, to, to deeply wound me and, and place fear in my heart that I've dedicated my whole life to something that is um, been labeled non-essential Mm -hmm. for health and for, for very valid reasons. However, it does make me reevaluate our place in society. And I happen to currently, I, I left the United States at the age of 18, unknowingly then lived in London, then Switzerland, then Germany, then touring and, and landed finally in Canada. And only recently when I got my passport did I realize that in fact I had left the United States to live in socialized democracies mm. and the the every single country I've lived in since I left the United States treats healthcare education and art equally mm. these are the pillars of society our physical health that every human has access to it education that every human has access to it and art every human has access to it and when art becomes that vital in a society, it doesn't have to be successful anymore. Mm -hmm. Art is there to express who we are in a live moment with the audience. And ideally the artist is transformed as much as the audience is transformed. And this responsibility to create art that will maybe make someone think in a larger capacity than they were before they saw that art or to feel 
and, and evolve their emotional intelligence is something that we actually cannot live without. Mm -hmm. And I want all my work from now on to embrace that absolutely essential need and responsibility um, in the live world. Bravo! <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Bravo! <laughs> Here's to making art that is not good nor bad, not successful nor unsuccessful. Woo! Amen. Art that is art. Yeah. Thank you. I we, agree. We, I agree. Denise, we'll wrap up with you. Today, I'm vibrating on what it means to decolonize an artistic approach. Um, I'm interested in being a creative collaborator stepping in the circle shoulder to shoulder with people and being in community. My identity as a black, non-binary, fluid, queer person in the world, it really makes me approach the work on a spectrum, really get mm -hmm. out of binary thought, think about our, our unseen biases mm -hmm. and approach the work with non-judgment and empathy. And on that note, I really want to say, um, um, and it's and it's creatives like DMX, Earl Simmons, that shows us that we can be, we can be strong, mm -hmm. we can be flawed, and we can be empathetic and interested in the growth of our community. Um, so yeah, that's that's the kind of energy, the the legacy and and the art I'm interested in creating. Amazing. Well, obviously I could go on for forever with you guys since I think I asked about four questions, but this was such a rich <laughs> conversation. Thank you so much for offering so much of your own personal wisdom as well as your professional experiences. Um, I urge all of our audiences out there to check out the bios of these incredible panelists so that you can continue to follow their work um, and just you know continue consuming their art because this is the future of it, y'all. Um, thank you so much. I'm Ruthie Fierberg. Again, thank you to Gypsy Snyder, Tanise Devia Johnson, and Luis Salgado. And thank you to you for being here. Be well, be safe.